uniting the races with truth instead of dividing them with lies. We also rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. Welcome to the second hour of the show today. We're moving right along again. After at 12 p.m. today, Pacific Standard Time, go to my website, boninfo.org, and check out check out my uh, this yesterday's Sunday service. Building a solid foundation this year is the theme. Very, 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 very interesting. We got to get people to be stronger. We must become a strong Christian people. Must. All right. So check it out. It'll be up at 12 noon today. Bondinfo.org. Building a strong foundation. That's what we're doing this year. Taking your phone calls as well. 888-775-3773. Jesse. Uh, in the third hour, the next hour, racist liberals make a mockery of, um, uh, Romney family. Their grandchild. It's amazing. We're going to deal with that coming up. And Jesse Jackson demands a meeting with A and E. <laughs> He's once again on the wrong side of the fence. That coming up for you in the third hour. But for now, it is preachers in the pulpit hour. Preachers in the pulpit already. That's me in the corner. Spot like losing my religion. Lots of folks are losing their religion. It's unfortunate. I have with me in this hour Pastor Ryan J. Bell. He was scheduled to be with us in studio this morning, but uh, I uh, I guess uh, I, I, I was. I think I was told due to scheduling conflict, he was not able to be in studio with us. But he is here by way of phone, telephone, and he is taking your phone calls at eight 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 seven seven. Will be eight 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 seven seven five three seven seven three eight 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 seven seven. Jesse, Doctor Ryan J. Bell has taught at Fuller Fuller Theological Seminary and Azusa Pacific University. He writes and contributes to books, including Manifest, of a Call to Faithful Creativity. He is the uh, co-founder and editor-in-chief of the Hearhurst Review. And we can go on and on about his accomplishment. He's been a pastor for the last 20 years. He wrote a very interesting article on the Huffington Post, a Year Without God, A Former Pastor's Journey into Atheism. He has decided that he's going to go a year without God. He is going to check out atheism. And I wanted to talk to him about that. Um, so uh, I, don't, I shouldn't call you Pastor Bell anymore, huh? just Ryan now, right? Just Ryan, yes. Happy New Year, sir. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year to you. I uh, appreciate you being here. I wish you well this year, even though you're Thank not you. going to ask any favors of God, and we're going to get to that in a minute. You uh, you were a pastor for 20 years with the, uh, uh, let's see here, uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Is that true? That's right. Seventh-day Adventist Church. And... Why did you become a pastor? Well, I, I became a pastor, I think, because I felt um, a calling in some way through my upbringing and my education. Um, I bounced around from a lot of uh, degree programs in college and finally landed on theology and the affirmation of my family and friends. It just seemed like the thing I was supposed to do. You write that uh, you you grew up as a Seventh Day Adventist in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, but your parents were United Methodists uh, when you were born back in uh, uh, what nineteen seventy one. Did they become uh, Seventh Day Adventists as well? Yes, they did. Oh. Yeah, they they joined the church, um, and then I was 
I was quite young, so I just went to church with them. I didn't know that uh, that the Seventh Day Adventist Church taught that they were the chosen people to prepare the world for the last days. Is that true? Yeah, if you um, ask different people, you get slightly different responses. But um, in general, the Seventh Day Adventist Church was born in the Second Great Awakening in the United States in the mid 1800s, uh, out of a fervor around the Second Coming, a lot like a lot of other groups, and uh, they felt they had a special message to prepare the world for the Second Coming of Jesus. Did you believe that at one point? Yeah, I did, of course. I mean, I would not have uh, become a pastor if I hadn't believed that. You are, you say you found some other things about the church. There were lots uh, about the church belief concerned in the last days that you didn't, you had trouble with. Can you give a couple examples of that? Well, I think, um, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church, like a lot of churches, while they don't, uh, well, let me back up. I mean, the church, one of the key events in the history of the church uh, was that it, they predicted that Jesus would return to the earth personally and visibly in 1844 as the fulfillment of a prophecy in Daniel 8 and 9. And, uh, of course, Jesus didn't return on October 22, 1844. And it became known in our history as the Great Disappointment. And uh, since then, we've gone on to, you know, realize that no no man knows the day or the hour, as the, as the Scripture says. So, right. Um, but we still maintained um, a quite a detailed, um, I guess, understanding of the events leading up to and surrounding the, the second coming of Jesus. And I, I would say that I, I little by little became less sure uh, of a lot of the details uh, in terms of the signs that people said were signs of the second coming, that, that it was eminent. Um, evidences, you know, in, in you know, current events and, and things yeah. like that. You know, where I just thought, man, every time something happens in the world, it's a sign that, that Jesus is coming again soon. And uh, one of our well-known preachers uh, just made a comment that, um, you know, the, the drought in California is a sign of something, you know, and I just, I, I guess I just have got weary of that and, and just felt like if Jesus comes visibly and personally to the earth, um, I don't necessarily need to know all the ins and outs of how and why he's going to do that. I, my job was to focus on, um, you know, doing God's work. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I've never understood why people would say that, tomorrow or next year or the year after the world is coming to an end when the scripture says that no one knows when that's going to happen or Jesus returning. It says no one knows and that we all should watch and pay attention and we will know what we need to know. And people predict that the world is coming to an end and folk believe it and they act out when they believe what someone says like that. It's just mind blowing to me. You said that you always had a, a nagging sense of not fitting in uh, with the church. What is what is that feeling? Why did you feel as though you didn't fit in? I mean, I think it was because I saw a lot of my colleagues, other clergy in the Adventist church, and, and I'm sure other churches as well, but the Adventist church is my is my, what I know. You know, I saw them really being sure of things, you know? And they would they would say with such confidence that they knew God what God wanted and and what the their place was in the world and what they were supposed to do and how they were supposed to convince others to live. And I just never felt like I had that kind of um surety, you know, I always had questions that didn't seem to have absolute answers. Mm-hmm. Even though I had a, a confidence enough to live you know, as a Christian, uh, I just didn't feel like I had their level of confidence. And I, so I felt like, man, maybe I'm not something wrong with me, you know? <laughs> yeah. Hold on a thought. Let me take a quick break. Back in a moment, folks.
Okay, folks, welcome back. We're going to get to your calls here in a minute. Uh, my guest is Dr. Ryan J. Bell. He is a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor who has decided that he will become an atheist for a year and that he's not going to have anything to do with God, not one iota of anything. Not going to play with him, not going to pray with him, not going to ask for favors, don't protect me, leave me alone for one year. Very, very interesting, and we're going to get to your calls here. Uh, Ryan, and I call him Ryan now because as of now, 2014, he's no longer a pastor. Uh, so you felt that you did not fit in with this church and, uh, or with religion or with this church in particular, and um, you you spoke out on issues, according to this article, uh, you spoke out on certain issues. Uh, like, uh, let's see here. I had been an outspoken critic of the church church's uh, church approach to our gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender members. Uh, that approach being exclusion or at best, second-class memberships. Membership. Uh, we won't kick them out, but we can't. But you can't participate in leadership. You also, according to this report, didn't like the way that the church treated women. And explain that to us. Um, well, I mean, in our denomination. For, a long, for the longest time, and, and most of the world still, women cannot be uh, ordained as uh, ministers, though we have found, again, a sort of workaround for women to become pastors, and we call it commissioning. So it's, again, a kind of a separate but equal type of, uh, or separate but not quite equal <laughs> um, <laughs> way to be ordained. And... Um, Actually, sort of recently, this past year, in 2013, the North American body of the Seventh-day Adventist Church did approve that each regional group can decide on their own if they want to ordain women as pastors. So, we're, you know, the Church is making some progress on that, but for its entire history, even though we had a uh, so-called prophet who was a woman, I mean, one of, the, one, of, one of the founders of the denomination and Church's prophet is a woman named Ellen White. So... It's kind of an interesting conundrum. For Why the is that? Why is that so important to you that women become preachers? Well, I, I, I mean, if they want to be, if they feel the gift and calling to do that, I feel like a woman should be able to do whatever she wants. So, um, but why is it so important to you personally? Well, I guess because I was uh, I, I witnessed so many colleagues and friends who did have a gift and a calling to to be leaders in the church and, and preachers, and they were being limited in that and treated differently. And I guess, you know, to me it's just about fairness, and any time I see someone being treated unfairly, it, it uh, triggers something in me. And how about, you all, You didn't like the way the, the, uh, the gays, the lesbians, the bisexuals, and transgender members were treated. How were they treated? Well, I mean, in general, it's fairly uncommon until recently for the church to even acknowledge its uh, gay and lesbian members. It was a kind of a don't ask, don't tell, and if they were found out, in some churches they were ostracized, and in other churches they were quietly allowed to, to be there. But it was definitely, you know, risky for um, the LGBT community to be in the church. When you, say, when, you say at, when you say acknowledge them, what do you mean about acknowledge them? What do you want them to do? What did you want the church to do? Well, I think to welcome them as members. I mean, necessarily um, to allow them to become full participating members of the church and not require them to hide in order to, um, to be present and, and worship and participate in leadership and, and participate in volunteering and that sort of thing. And so churches are making some progress on that. They'll, you know, allow their, uh, because a lot, let me, let me just say there's a, a, quite a few couples, you know, that attend church. Couple what? And same sex couple? couple? Yeah, same sex couple, oh. yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, it was difficult for them to be 
uh, there as a couple just because it definitely was, um, you know, brought to the awareness of the rest of the members that, that there was a couple here. And, and then some of the more, you know... When you say, uh, um, did you, when you say, did you want them to be acknowledged as Christians or what? I, I don't. I mean, you want them to? Did, did you want the pastor to have them stand up and say, "I'm gay and no. I'm proud"? No, 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 no. I just <clears throat> mean that they're like anybody else, like anybody else but, in the church. But like, I was under the impression that. Excuse me. I was under the impression that all sinners are welcome to the church because the church is like a hospital. You go there to get healing. Yeah, and I think that is the ideal. And Did you want of, them I, to acknowledge the murders and rapists and liars and thieves and <laughs> all, all, all those people as well? Did you want the same yeah. acknowledgement, acknowledgement for all of them? Well, I wouldn't make an analogy between rapists and thieves and, and people who are gay. Um, I mean, I think but but, but it's a sin, right? Did you want all, just as homosexuality is a sin... There were other sinners in the church doing different types of sins. Did you want those yeah. sinners to be acknowledged as well? Well, first of all, I would say uh, all sinners should be welcome in the church. I don't, I don't believe that being a homosexual or being in a gay committed relationship is a sin. And I guess that's what set me apart in some ways as well. Why don't so you I believe would, that? That is a sin. Uh, well, because I, I don't think that... Um, First of all, I don't think that the, the critique in the Bible, the, the two or three verses that we have in the Bible um, about homosexuality refer to the kind of uh, same-sex relationships that we see today in the world. Um, I think there are plenty of ways to sin as a heterosexual person, and there are plenty of ways to sin, according to the Bible, as a homosexual person. But God is but not happy with any sin at all. That's why he sent Christ. So that we can, so that we can overcome sin. He didn't accept any type of sin, whether it's adultery or whatever. You have to love one another. I mean, he didn't accept any type of sins. So why should the homosexual sin be any different? No, I'm not saying. I'm t- talking about accepting sin. I'm talking about accepting people, um, and not referring to their core identity as sinful any more than being of a particular ethnicity would be sinful. Did you? Did you feel the same way about the people who committed adultery? You didn't want them, uh, their sins to be referred to as a sin? To be referred to as a sin? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's all kinds of sins. We're going around, like, you know, naming people's sins, but everyone is in, is welcome in the congregation. Right. Every, everybody has their private, you know, lives. And I think one of the interesting things is that, uh, that we discovered was that heterosexual people um, are are not called to the same account, and, and I'm not saying that the answer is now we got to line everybody up and name their sins, but I'm just saying it, it seems a little uh, disingenuous to pick on one group of people uh, and name their sins and out them and ex- ostracize them while other people are, you know, greedy and um, but covetous. Then, but most and, churches tend to... Uh go against any types of sin. They tell us all to repent and be born okay. again. Is sexuality a core identity? I think so. Oh, you do? Yeah, I mean, I think our sexuality is essential to who we are. We're, we're, we're created with that. <laughs> oh. Um, so let me ask. So because the church is, or this particular church, the Seventh-day Adventist, where you were a pastor for 20 years, did not acknowledge the sin of homosexuality in the right way and then treat women well, you have decided this year that you are going to dump God and become an atheist. When I come back, I want to talk about that, what that feels like to for you just to dump God. And then we'll take some calls for you. 888-7753-773, back in a moment. Okay, folks, we're moving right along here. Everybody and the mama want to get in on this. Uh, former Pastor Ryan Bell uh, is with us. He wrote a very interesting article on the uh, Huffington Post there, um, A Year Without God, A Former Pastor's Journey into Atheism. And as you've heard, he became unhappy with the way that um, 
He's been a pastor for the last 20 years with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And uh, he became unhappy in the way that they were treating the, the homosexuals, uh, transgender gendered folks, and women. So he spoke out about it. And eventually, according to the, this report, he was asked to leave the church. So he stepped down. Didn't want to do it, really, but all this, due to all the stress, he stepped down. And now he's going to check out atheism. Uh, Ryan, let me ask. Uh, so now you have decided, and, and that's starting this year, right, 2014, that you will not have anything to do with God. Here's what you said in this article. I am making it official and embarking on a new journey. I will try on atheism for a year. For the next 12 months, I will live as if there is no God. I will not pray, read the Bible for inspiration, refer to God as the cause of things or hope that God might intervene and change my own or someone else's circumstances. And you say in parentheses, I trust that if there is really, if there really is a God, that God will not be uh, to something by my foolish experiment and allow others to suffer as a result. And you said that you're going to really get into atheism. You're going to read their books. You're going to speak at their meetings. You're going to talk to them, hang out with them, and become them. Um, is that true that you're going to do this, that you are doing this? Yeah, I am doing it. So as of January 1, 2014, you have nothing to do with God at all? Well, I mean, I think you can't really go on this journey and say I'm having nothing to do. The question of God is at the center of the journey. Um, so whether you're a theist or an atheist, the question is still about the existence of God. So it's not like you can avoid the question. It's sort of like, I would say, I was saying to a friend the other day that it's a little bit like race. Race is a social construct, and so in one sense you could say there is no such defining concept as race, but as a social reality, uh, race is a reality, and so we address it as such. And I think even if you're an atheist, you could say there is no God, but God certainly exists in the social sphere, and it has to be, we have to address it there. And so I, I don't think it's possible to avoid the question of God. That's certainly not my goal. My goal is to explore the limits of theism, to explore the, um, the view of the world that I would have if I looked at the world with different lenses, with, with the lenses that, that say there is no God. What would the world look like from that vantage point? You did, did Christianity work for you personally? Did it work? I mean, I think it worked for me for a while. Um, sure, I think. How did it work and, for you for a while? I mean, I think it gave me a sense of direction and hope, um, the assurance that if things weren't okay now, that one day they would be okay. Um, you know, Christianity gave me a sense of belonging to something bigger than myself. And then after a while, you lost all of that? You said it worked for a while. After a while, you didn't believe that anymore, or those things anymore? Well, it wasn't like a switch was flipped and I suddenly didn't believe those things anymore. I, I just started to see cracks in the story and in my own experience where things... I feel like maybe I was trying so hard because I was a pastor, I had to believe these things. I mean, and so I um, really pushed myself to believe some things that once I wasn't a pastor anymore, I sort of had the freedom to consider the possibility that they aren't the way that I always have said. And so you... And I don't... Go ahead. I, was, I don't know where the end of the journey is going to be. Like, I might come on this journey and decide that a certain kind of theism is... Uh, something I believe in. I, I know I, I probably, I'm pretty confident I'm not a traditional theist, but um, I may not end up as an atheist either. I don't know. I mean, there's a whole range of ways that you can approach the question of theism versus atheism. It's not simply, you know, option A or option B. There's like kind of a range of 
ways of looking at that. It sounded as though you became angry at the church because you didn't like the way that they treated uh, women and, and the homosexuals. And because you became angry at the church, it changed your attitude toward God as well, as though you're blaming God for the way the church is acting. No, I don't think I was, I mean, I don't, anger was never a big part of my response to any of this. I don't think I was, I was frustrated, and, but I, I, I loved the church. I gave my life to serving the church. I, I put my, myself and my family through a lot of difficulties to serve the church. So Are the, you, you know, married? Church, uh, yes. Yeah. You have, you have a, child, a wife and children? I have two girls. Really? Um, yeah. And how does your wife feel about this? Well, you know, it's, our family has gone through a lot of stress as a result of all of this. So, you know, she's on her own journey. And um, I respect that. Your wife and, is on her own journey now? Oh, of course. I mean, I mean we, we're all on our own journey, right? I mean, each of us has a, a personal relationship to these questions. And so I'm not... What I, does you know, she say about you turning away from God? You're, you're the head of your wife and your children. Well, and now yeah, that the know. head doesn't believe in the creator, what yeah. does she say about that? Well, I don't approach uh, my family as though I'm the head of anything. I, I think, you know, we're, <laughs> we're in this together, and she has her own choices, and I have my but choices. But what did she say about you turning away from God? I mean, I, she knows about my questions. I mean, she's lived with me, and she knows about my questions. And But what um, does she say about it, though? You're not telling me. When you say, honey... <laughs> Next year, I, I want nothing to do with God. I won't be praying with you or for you. What did she say? Well, she's concerned about our livelihood. You know, she's concerned about uh, that sort of thing. But um, she she respects my journey, and she was she's you know concerned, a little surprised, like a lot of people, a little perplexed, like a lot of people. But she's um, mostly been worried about my future. And so, uh, starting January 1 of this year, you have not prayed to God or asked anything of Him? That's right. Um, that's amazing to me. Are, are you scared? <laughs> I mean, sometimes. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> if I'm honest. I'm, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people have these questions. I mean, I, I bet if you're listening, we'll see. But, I mean, I bet your listeners, um, some of them, you know, notice that when you, sometimes you pray for something, like, say, for example, someone to be healed from an illness, and they are. And then sometimes you pray for someone to be healed, and they're not. And then sometimes you don't pray for someone, and they are healed. And sometimes you don't pray for someone, and they're not healed. I mean, all of these things happen, and it kind of makes you begin to wonder, like, is it just random? Is, you know, is there any... So, so part of my, my quest is to say, will life be any different if I, if I don't approach my life as though there's a God? And I, I think a lot of Christians live as functional atheists anyway. Wow. I don't think most. I don't me, think most. Let me take a break, uh, uh, Ryan, and we'll come back and take some calls. Back in a moment. Okay, moving right along, we're talking to Ryan Bell, former pastor of twenty years, Seventh Day Adventist pastor, who decided no more God, not for a year. And I am getting to your calls now, folks, at 888-775-3773, jesse Let's go out to Phoenix, Arizona and talk to Guy. Guy, good morning, sir, and welcome to the show. You're on with Ryan Bell. Hey, uh, good morning, Jesse, and good morning, Mr. Bell. Morning. Hey, uh, good morning. the question that I have, first of all, uh, I'm going to tell you how I feel. My, my, my walk with uh, my God is personal. And personal only. It's not some doctrine that I read. I take uh, the scriptures, and I can uh, decipher them myself. I, the question that I ask: When you were a pastor, did you, weren't you, were you a warrior for uh, uh, for the Lord, or were you just a pastor in a doctrine? What, 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 what? And I want your definition of a warrior, and then I want to give you the definition of my definition of a warrior. Yeah, well, language is an interesting thing. I would not have, have called myself a warrior in part because I think it's, uh, wow, yeah, where to begin? I mean, I think I, if I understand the gist of your question, I would say I was uh, an earnest uh, servant of God, you know, and, and bringing, bringing God's uh, love and truth and justice and peace to the world uh, and doing my best to do that and to invite other people to do that as well. But yeah, I was an active 
Christian. Um, I think uh, that's my understanding of what you mean by by warrior. To me, the word warrior kind of uh, is a little puzzling for me. But well, no, what, no. Why why would it be puzzling? Why would it be puzzling? Well, it's a violent. Uh, you no, know, if you a, believe in something, believe in anything, you're a warrior. I mean, that's just just how a, a person should react to, to life. It's not being a warrior is not bad. But let me hear it. Uh, a warrior is an ordinary man that takes everything he faces as a challenge and turns it in as a blessing from God. So every time that you have a challenge, see, you must have had some challenges that you uh, uh, failed at. Instead of instead of working at were the challenges That's like a good uh, question. Did you have some traumas uh, that uh, that in your life that uh, uh, God failed you at? Very good question. Well, I mean, I think I don't know. Like, I mean, I think it was a slow erosion um, <laughs> of of my uh, confidence in some of the traditional teachings, um, the inability of. A lot of Christians, for example, to take science seriously, and it wasn't. Well, I'm not angry at God. I mean, why would you be angry at a being that's not well, there? Well, here, here's the thing: if you're going to take a walk with atheism, you're going to have to go in a real walk with them. You're going to have to be part of them and how they treat Christians too. You need to be sit in there, not just go read their uh, their writings and what they do, what they're about. And here's another thing. I, I, when you get through with this year, I want to know a foundation uh, uh, that is atheism or anything that's done anything for humanity. And I'd like you to come on, Jesse, and tell him what, what foundation that is. I, I was going to ask, ask you, Ryan, during this year, will you come back and kind of update us on how things are going for you? Yeah, that's, that's possible. I mean, I, I sometimes I feel like the... Um, there's a lot. There, there are, you know, types of ways of talking about this that we're, we're not on the same page. But I, I wouldn't mind. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't mind, uh, you know, giving you a sense of where things are at. Yeah. I mean, there's just a, there's just a lot of assumptions implicit in a lot of the things that we're saying. For instance, that you know, for example, that atheists have no moral grounding or that they're they haven't done anything good for the world. Where I mean, do they? All, if they don't believe in God, where where, where do they get their more grounded from? And from being a human being, you know, from being a human being. I mean, I, I think I would challenge any of you that are listening or, you know, the caller to, um, if, you, if you feel that way, to do what I'm doing, not all the way perhaps, but find some people in your life that don't believe in God and ask yourself, do they have any moral grounding? And well, you're I've, I've, find talked out to they, tr- I've talked to a truckload of them already. They say they get their values from the earth and from the trees and, and the hippies. Oh. <laughs> okay, I mean, thank you, guys. No, nobody's ever said that to me. I, they get their values from being a human being. Let's go uh, to Los Angeles to talk to the Baba Go To Guy. Baba Go To Guy, you're on with Ryan Bell. Well, if you got your values from uh, other human beings, oh, thank you, Jesse, for having me on. Um, then you would know that after ten thousand years of um, existence, you know, homosexual marriage has never been you know, a, a done deal anywhere on the earth except maybe Sodom and Gomorrah and maybe a couple other states, you know, like, um, that we don't know about. But um, it's pretty much been rejected everywhere because people can just see it's, 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 um, it's just unseemly, to, to say the least. And so, you know, your journey, sir, will eventually take you to, you know, because atheists, they love, Atheists being their own god, they have to set up a city-state called socialism and communism that kind of goes along with their beliefs and where where man is now subject, instead of being subject to God in his own conscience, he'll be subject to a, a super-state like we're developing in this country and that, you know, Soviet Russia had. So that's, that's, that's a prophecy of where your beliefs will eventually take you. And Ryan, you say, corruption. And you say, Ryan... I mean that's a mouthful. I I don't know. I mean I don't even know what to say. That I, first of all, atheists don't believe that they're their own god. They don't believe in any god. And no, they, they, have to, the they have to believe, they believe in something in because we all live by belief. We live by faith in something. So they do believe in something. Reason, yes, they do. reason, uh, evidence. I mean I and I don't. 
to say that every atheist is trying to set up a communist socialist state, that's, that's absurd. I mean, most, no, of, the, it, that's, that's most the of the atheists that I've talked to all. want to be individuals left alone to pursue their own life the way that well, they, then why do they Why do they meet and get together as though they're going, they're going to church? Atheism, atheism churches are being built everywhere now. If they, want to be, if they want to be an individual, why do they have to go and find people to approve their, or validate how they feel and what they think? I don't think that most of them do. I, there are some recent iterations, uh, recent examples of um, atheist gatherings, but most of the people that I've talked to so far... You know, I said in my piece, I, I'll attend hold, some atheist gatherings. Yeah, hold, and, that, hold that thought. Let me take a break here. Uh, Bobby, go to God. Thank you, sir. Okay, folks, in the next hour, our MSNBC host attack Romney's family, his little black grandchild. Um, amazing stuff coming up in the next hour. Ryan Bell is with me, a former pastor who has decided to drop God and check out atheism for a year. Uh, Ryan, when the year is up, are you coming back to God or going back to God? I don't know. Oh, I see. I, I didn't know that you can go in and out with him. Yeah, you know, I thought once you believed in him, you're locked in him. Uh, well, I mean, it's like I would think it's like any relationship. If it's if God is there and He wants us to have a personal relationship with Him, I'm, you know, a lot of my friends who are believers have said to me, you know, the God they believe in is, you know, not going to leave me. And, um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think it's, um, it's, it's a thing where yeah, I'm locked in. Let me, uh, I have a, uh, a tweet, uh, um, is this a, from Twitter or Facebook question for you. This person says, the fact that atheists are so obsessed with the non-existence of God proved to me that they are pretty worried. If you really don't believe in God, you will drop him for good and move on and not go find, go, and not go find people that agree with you to gain some kind of reassurance. And you say? Well, I mean, I would, I would say flip the script and say you have a friend who is considering becoming a Christian, but they're not sure. And they're going to come to your church for a while, and they're going to try out being, being a Christian. And you're probably going to encourage them to do that because you think that at the end they're going to be a Christian uh, if, they, if they stick with it for long enough. And so you... Uh, you know, you encourage them to come to church. And when they come to church, someone says, are you a Christian? And they say, well, I don't know, probably not, not yet at least, uh, but I'm going to give it a try. It's, just, it's the same thing. Like, but I'm, Christianity is a religion. Uh, and you, and you say atheism is not. Right. So now. Athe <laughs> atheism is not a religion. Yeah. So your point is not a good point. Well, I mean, it's a belief system. It's a philo well, not a belief system, but it's a philosophy. It's a it's a way of looking at the world. It is a belief system. You're right about that because we live yeah, by it, faith. We got to believe in something. Yeah, I mean, it's or it's, a, it's an unbelief system or a belief. System. Yeah, so, well, well, unbelief system is still a belief system. Yeah, I see your point. Yeah. Um, so, right, when you come back, you what's that? When you come back during the year, and so we can update the folks on what's happening with you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Why we'll maybe? Yeah. Why not solid? Yes. Why are you saying maybe? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I can I can come back. I can come All back. Right. I just atheists don't lie, do they? Uh, some probably do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. All right. Thanks for having me.